credits across northern Australia. They've generated about $90 million in credits um, so far through their, through their industry. Um, I guess something you don't know about me, um, I had a really nice Indian meal at the Standpipe Hotel last night, so thanks for all those people who rec <laughs> recommended that. Surprising, but really delicious. Um, and when we got involved, when I got involved in the industry, actually it was, um, I was at the Business Council of Australia before I uh, started at the ILSC. Um, and I, found, I started hearing about this, um, these carbon projects in Northern Australia. And it piqued the interest of a lot of Australia's largest companies that were sort of waking up to the fact that they had big carbon liabilities um, and had to start sort of understanding uh, where they were gonna get credits from. And before that, I'd lived and worked in remote Australia. And I never thought I'd see those two things come together so closely. So here is, you know, one of our most pressing global challenges. Um, and the solution for it sits in um, some of our most ancient practices of land stewardship um, and restoration. And there's a market for it. And so um, that got me really excited. And that's when I met um, Emily when I was at the Business Council. So it was around 2013-14. Um, and now at the ILSC, our role is really about how do we support um, both traditional owners and Aboriginal um, leaseholders and freehold uh, landholders to understand the opportunity in HIR. And that's the question we get asked most often is, um, what's this opportunity and how do we get involved? Thanks, Jen. Hi. Now, I suspect a lot of us already know who Mr McIntosh is, so you don't have to do the introduction, but you do have to answer the two questions, which is, uh, when did you start getting interested in this space? Um, I think we might have heard a, a already, but, um, and also, uh, what's the number one question you get asked? And tell us something we don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, well, the, to answer the first question first, something that you may not know about me is that, that I've managed to survive despite being a one-eyed power supporter. <laughs> <laughs> but um, how did I get involved in thinking about carbon farming? Um, initially through some uh, discussions in various boards, as John said, uh, but also uh, as a landholder near Blinman in a group um, of people interested in it, probably uh, probably 18 months ago now, and you know, through uh, reading uh, a lot of stuff and asking a lot of questions and, and nothing like uh, personal involvement to really uh, you know, bring you in touch with something that uh, you're interested in. But, um, in terms of questions that, um, well, the question that I keep asking myself, I guess, is that this seems to be such uh, a rapidly developing field, not only carbon farming, but also envir environmental services generally. Um, at, you know, as the world starts to realise that we do have to make some changes, that how do you actually take advantage now without locking out further opportunities in the future in terms of your landscape? I'm writing that one down. Okay, so um, uh, a couple of housekeeping tips that we're gonna start with. So for those of you online, and that includes um, the other guys that we have online, which is uh, some of the staff at PERSA who are working in this space, but we've also got the Commonwealth regulator, hi Ella, um, and uh, Greg Patton, who is actually got a project uh, currently going through registration. So I thought he might be uh, um, an also interesting one to have online. If you would like to uh, have a comment or um, answer a question that comes up, um, same too with Louisa and Dean and Emily, just raise your hand, that little hand button up the top. Um, I'll see it and I'll throw to you. Uh, and for those of you guys uh, in the audience, um, we have a roaming microphone, and what I'm going to ask, given this COVID safe world that we all live in, is that um, if you raise your hand, we'll give you the microphone, ask your question, but hand it back to the person that um, has given it to you so that we can wipe it down and give it to the next person. Uh, but So I'm going to kick off with the first question. Um, moderator's right, and I'm going to actually direct it to Mr Gavin. So, John, you um, helped produce the... Uh, the, you, the 
report that's been released today and some of the fact sheets, the SA Parcel Rangelands Carbon Potential Report, which is at the back of the room, as the Minister said. Um, and I was just wondering, out of that report and some of the outcomes that out of it, has there been any surprises? Was there anything that came out of that analysis in terms of the opportunity, the mapping that was done? Was there any surprises or is it something that was um, uh, you knew and it's just nice to see all come into the one spot? Um, I wouldn't say there are any surprises. I think the people that have been looking at this stuff for a while have seen this and um, in some ways South Australia is a little bit late to the party so it's reflecting what's happening in other jurisdictions anyway. I think the new things in the report I suppose are around um, the level of detail that we can get to now. So when the carbon farming industry started in some of the other jurisdictions there were, there were a lot more unknowns so there's a greater level of certainty in the information that's in that report now. Um, and critically, we're, we're in a different policy space. And um, you know, policy risk in the carbon market is something that we've all been dealing with for a long time. And, but that is actually um, going away as well. So the timing of the report is probably as important as what's in it. That's great, thank you. Bill, is there anything that you wanted to add? You've read the report. Is there anything that you know that you wanted to to highlight that's in that report or that you know um, really caught your attention? I think um, I mean the case studies are, I think very useful, and uh, I think that really shows pretty dramatically the potential. And and even though it depends on your type of country and the amount of um, you know. Uh, land systems you've got in, you know, in the in the HIR uh, area, it, it still demonstrates a pretty amazing potential, um, you know, that everyone probably needs to look at. Excellent. Right. Does anyone want to raise their hand, or I can ask another question? Has anyone got? Um, we've got a. Oh, and we've got a microphone in the front, please. And uh, Louis, if you can grab the gentleman in the red shirt. Thank you. Um, it's very well documented that um, vast areas of, um, you know, pastoral areas are, are, have got bare ground. And when you look at the um, um, many documents uh, um, around the world, that bare ground uh, releases enormous amount of carbon into the, into the atmosphere. Whereas if you build up your grasslands and ground cover, uh, as well as the bush that, you know, the methodology we're currently using, that captures and sequences a lot of carbon back into the soil. So I've got two questions. One is, why are grasslands and ground cover not included in carbon farming methodology? And my second question is, what do pastoralists and farmers need to do to change this to include a whole of farm approach? And so everything, if we regenerate our properties and build up our grasslands and build up the ground cover, and put a whole farm approach towards it, why can't we get carbon credits across the whole farm? <laughs> I thought you'd clap at that. Okay, I am actually gonna ask John to first answer that one, and then I might um, ask Emily after that, if that's okay, Emily, it's something that you might comment. So, to start the question session with that question is really, you know, it really has hit the nail on the head for the opportunities in South Australia. So clearly non-forest vegetation is crucial to our grazing industries, it's crucial to the environment, it's crucial to the, do the diversity um, that Dean was talking about. So yep, the, getting a non-forest method or a, or a full integrated pastoral method would be fantastic. What we're talking about at the moment is the Australian regulated market, so Australian carbon um, credit units. There are methods out there that deal with grasslands and that sort of stuff. They're, they're operated under different um, systems and different markets. Um, and there are people in Australia that are selling credits from those now. They're just not a regulated credit through, through the ACUs. Um, why we don't have it is because of that definition of a, of a forest. So that um, two metres high, 20% canopy cover, greater than 0.2 of a hectare, that's a Kyoto forest. It's, it's the regulated forest, and that's what the methods have been dealing with in that regulated market. But yep, absolutely, 
a, a, a consolidated rangelands method would be a fantastic thing and people are working towards it. It's just going to be a matter of time. And if the minister was here, I would probably be saying what an awesome opportunity for South Australia to grab would be to drive that method. I'll uh, pass that on for you. Um, and yeah, I was, I was actually, before I judge to Emily, um, I was actually going to say that there is, there is uh, work happening in that space that I've heard about um, and seen. And I think it's um, something that's progressing fast and that is, uh, sh won't be too far away, I would say. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, Emily. I think, thanks, Jen, <clears throat> and thanks for the question. I, I think what I was going to add is being covered, and that is that uh, we need to work within the scheme. And as I mentioned in the presentation, that scheme is as good as it as good as it is, and it's it's trying hard to keep up with innovation. Um, but part of that engagement, and I think part of the shift. I don't know if um, if Ella wants to comment on this as well, but part of the shift that I'm seeing. Um, forgive me for backtracking across the street, but originally the carbon farming scheme allowed people from anywhere to propose methods. Um, but there was a lot of grassroots um, proposal of, of methodologies. Uh, that meant that there was a lot of innovation and great ideas, but it also meant that the Offsets Integrity Committee, who were in charge of assessing those methods for scientific robustness, um, were quite overwhelmed. So the scheme then shifted to a top-down model that the minister and the department pr proposed uh, methods. And, and now we're, we're seeing more of a collaborative response starting to evolve where there is a lot more involvement of industry and pastoralists and those who are, um, are going to be involved in the, in the rollout of methods, but also um, those who are going to need to assess them and make sure that they have the integrity attaching to them for the, the federal regulated scheme. The other point I make is um, that, that the comment is correct. There are a number of voluntary standards out there um, that people can use. Some of them are part of an um, international uh, framework and they're, they're administered with, with a degree of transparency and, and quite good credibility. Differences, and I think we're focusing on this discussion, is that the Australian market largely been dominated by ACUs, carbon farming, which, which necessarily has a lot of detail that tries to move as quickly as it can. So I think part of it is working with you, with the department, with the South Australian government and with the federal government um, to move the method development and also method stacking. So this idea of being able to have different activities across landscapes. Um, again, we're evolving from cookie cutter projects and plantations um, back in the day when forest was really seen as the only sort of carbon project opportunity to really into a whole lot of active management and landscape scale method developments. It's exciting. Um, Ella, I um, see your hand up, so I'm going to throw to you. Turn your mic on, and, and uh, Ella's from the uh, Clean Energy Regulator in the Australian Government. So. Hi, everyone. So the the there there is currently a method to credit changes in soil carbon uh, over a property. The, the sticking point for, for rangelands properties with that method is that it requires quite a lot of measurement. So being able to get that, that method workable across a, a, a big landscape is quite difficult at the moment. As Emily pointed out, there's, there's been some administrative changes to the scheme so that the clean energy regulator is now taking responsibility for method development. Um, the minister, Angus Taylor's identified soil carbon as a key priority for method development. And I think one of the one of the things we're really aiming to do with a new method for soil carbon is unlock the potential for those larger properties to participate. Okay, thanks, Ella. Dean, did you have your hand up or have you put it back down? <laughs> uh, most, most of what I was gonna say has been said. <clears throat> Yeah, that, so that a method exists um, already. The stumbling block from a practical implementation is cost of measurement. To do it according to the method and to verify soil carbon changes over such large and variable landscapes. But the additional comment I'll make is that, as Elle has alluded, there's, there's work on currently to modify the method, the rules, if you like, um, but the other 
good news is that technologies and approaches to measure and estimate are changing rapidly and there's a large number of people ourselves included working on that area so that that uh, rangelands and rangelands are not excluded from the method because ultimately it's going to need a cost effective and reliable and accurate uh, verification and measurement but that will come but a, but a great question and I totally agree with that whole of, whole of system thinking um, and carbon is moving pretty quickly away from these arbitrary categories that have had their time in history really about what is a forest in a semi-arid landscape to now various bodies and entities collectively looking at saying if we can increase carbon in the landscape, it doesn't shouldn't matter if it's in the soil, in the grasses or in the trees, if it's verifiable and it's there for the long term, then carbon's carbon. A tonne of carbon is a tonne of carbon. So good question and we'll get there collectively. Um, and if you can hand the microphone to the gentleman in the front. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, Terence Coldheart, um, and I am a person from Flinders Ranges area. I too would like to acknowledge the, um, the Rangala people, Rangala people of this area, past, present, and emerging. I've got a uh, question to the, to this forum, I guess, and then I'll look around to see who's who's got their hand up uh, in relation to SEB on their properties. Is anyone? Does anyone have uh, an SEB on their property? Does anyone here, yep, have an SEB on their property? One, couple, yep, yep, there's a few. Okay, yeah, that's great. See, because why I wanted to ask that question is because with this uh, SEB opportunity, like a special environmental benefits opportunity, I was able to work closely with, with the pastoral board and, and the, um, and the um, native title holders of that area to able to get an area set aside for SEB, uh, it, it's, I've got the credits, but there's only one party uh, interested in, in, in buying the credits. My question to is that, yes, I'd like to, you know, look at this carbon farming on this property, but uh, is it just a white elephant, you know? Uh, are we going to have credits and no buyers? because I'm in, I'm in a situation where I've got credits and no buyers for SEB. Okay, Jess, do, is that something that you feel comfortable um, answering or John, I know that you can as well. I might jump in there because I've done a little bit with the SEB market in South Australia and it's a, it is a slightly different situation around how um, environmental benefit is developed and credited and then having a buyer and so the the difference in the market response, so for a carbon market, the market is much bigger, the market is national and international. The market for the significant environmental benefit offsets is actually determined by where a clearance activity occurs and how, um, how local it is to the area that you're working in and what the benefit is that we're then trying to see. So the, the SEB market um, is, is connected to the carbon market like environmental markets are, but they're very, very um, different in terms of the mechanism and how they work, the security of the buyer and that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah, just add to that, I suppose, with, with um, the experience of Indigenous groups in Northern Australia with cut producing and selling carbon credits, is that there is a lot of demand for, particularly for Indigenous carbon credits. Um, they're seen as there's a premium sometimes paid for voluntary buyers. So people like Qantas, some of the resources companies um, will pay a 20% sort of premium uh, on carbon credits that come from indigenous land because they know there's a co-benefit that's often generated. So people are out on country, in, you know, there's employment, there's healthy country outcomes, uh, there's education and cultural outcomes as well. So, but obviously one of the things that we're looking at in both WA and South Australia with these HIR rangeland projects is, is to really understand what the potential is, uh, what it's gonna cost to establish projects, so the fencing and things that Dean talked about, and then from that are uh, there income and employment and other opportunities um, 
that would see a carbon project stack up on Aboriginal held land. Does that, does that answer your question, sort of? It's, there's, there's definitely buyers uh, in terms of the carbon credits and um, uh, in particular, um, as Jess said, there's um, a lot of interest in Indigenous carbon projects. So um, I will also add to that with a, my government hat on, take the external hat off, um, and just say that we're actually also looking into the world of how SEBs and carbon projects uh, work. Um, and on 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 a proper on one property, and if that can happen, and how that can happen, uh, so that's something where we're, we're going to um, look into it from a state perspective, but we're also going to look into from uh, and talk to the Commonwealth about as well, because it's it's uh, something we're still learning about ourselves. Okay, does um, anyone want to ask a question? Um, and in the front, while you're getting the microphone, I've got one. Um, I want to talk about the price of carbon. So we understand that, um, and many forecasts are suggesting that it seems inevitable that the price will go up, but could it also drop? Could it uh, disappear and could it become zero? And what's the risk of that? And how do they uh, potentially factor that into a, a project plan and their decisions when they're making a call? Um, does anyone? I'm gonna. I'm gonna throw it to the audience, Mr. D Tim Moore, uh, Dr. Tim Moore. Can you um, maybe talk to that? Because I've had a conversation with you about that. Um, but I'll also. Uh, oh yeah, I told. I totally stole the microphone here. the journal have back on. That's okay, I allowed you to do that. Um, oh, and, and Russell at the back, can I, Louise, um, I'll just get this gentleman to ask his question, Russell, and then I'll come to you, if that's two seconds. That's all right? Oh, okay, go, you follow up from Tim, and then um, if that's... Sorry, Dr. So very quickly, um, with an optional contract with the Australian government, yeah. you can lock in a 10-year contract, at, that's basically your floor price. So if you can get an optional contract, lock in 10 years, and that's your revenue guarantee. What happens beyond 10 years? Maybe, I don't know. So you've got a 10 year, you've got a 10 year forward contract. Yep. If you don't deliver, there's no penalty, you're locked in to the price. So, that's, so there is that's an option to, to secure a price for 10 years in, un, under a, okay. Um, it's your turn. Hi, my question is for Dean. Uh, my name's Glenn Christie from Succession Ecology. I was impressed by the pacing of your talk and I thought it was really clear, but what stuck out to me was the picture you had of that dead plant and that green circle of life underneath it. And I'm wondering if that's basically a pixel for a virtuous cycle 
on what we're trying to do here, where you were mentioning that's capturing rainfall, there's biomass, there's organic matter, there's all sorts of activity going on. Can we use that then to, to, get, to look at landscape scale? That captures more rain, more percolates in, temperatures drop, rainfalls increase. What does that do to the rate of sequestering carbon? Thanks. Yes, I, I, I agree with what you've, you've, your summary there, and that, that's really what I encourage us all to look at is that, which was, I think the first question was around that systems thinking, our whole of business, our whole of landscape, that any management practice that's following the rules for a particular method, yes, we've got to be compliant, it's got to be verifiable, but it's also got to fit into the real world, which is both biology and economics. So if we can be triggering landscape change and repair where it's needed and build our capacity for sustainable production, then I, you know, I totally agree with your summary of that, of that picture. What does it do to the rate of carbon sequestration? Um, you know, I, I think there's a few things I would add or comment on that. It, it builds the resilience of the carbon project itself because you've got even if we just limit it for discussion purposes, better water infiltration, water retention in the landscape where the rain falls, you're removing one of the big risks around a carbon project, as is primary production, and that's around seasonal events. So if we're getting more productivity for every mill of rain that lands on our place, we can be taking away one of those major constraints and risks around carbon, you know, and, and all of the other commodities that we produce from land. Um, as we move towards new method development and new technologies that make those methods cost effective, then we can also be bringing in, um, as, as Emily mentioned about stacking methods, so we can be incorporating soil carbon as well as the grass layer, as well as the tree layer. And if you've got the whole of system functioning, there will be areas, ecosystems and niches where the woody vegetation is the dominant carbon source in parts of the landscape but in other parts of the landscape most of it will be below ground and in yet again other parts it's 50 50 and everything in between those categories so there's an increased potential for sequestration rate through good land management plus there's a, an opportunity to bring in other carbon stocks other carbon pools into by, by combining methods or as a collective developing new methods. Okay. Um, I, I had a question from a, a lady in the audience um, earlier. Oh, is there a hand? Oh, M. Yeah, there, yes, there is. Uh, sorry, Jen, I think, um, I think the way the screen's structured, you can't see no, my I little can't. electronic That's hand. Okay. So I might, I might raise a physical hand when I... <laughs> Well, I've got something to say. I just wanted to come back on that point um, and also the SEB's point from earlier. Um, the SEB issue, and I, I think it's great that it's being worked on because it, it's in step with, with what I mentioned in the presentation around a, a move towards... There's a buzz phrase at the moment called nature-based solutions, and it's bringing together carbon, biodiversity and systems approaches that Dean was just talking about. So there is, there is this trend emerging. Unfortunately, like most things, as we move forward, there's, there's bits that get left behind, and... The, the newness or the additionality requirements under the Act, uh, some of the tricky aspects around whether or not you've already committed land or are doing things on land that mean that, that the carbon yield is actually not necessarily going to be in addition to what's already occurring there. So conservation covenants and the like, um, presumably SEBs, different markets, and, and it, it's intended to try and continue integrity in the system. So. The newness requirement, that additionality requirement, is, is an important one. And I think if you're looking at SEBs today, you'd you'd try and look at ways to package an SEB as part of a carbon project rather than do one before the other. And, and that's unfortunately sort of an evolution of time, evolution of market uh, consideration. Price, I also just wanted to make an observation that, um, yes, politics is, is relevant, as is whether or not... Um, Minister Taylor goes ahead with, with specific credits within the safeguard mechanism because there is demand coming from, as I said, um, companies that have emitting, emitting liability and they purchase carbon credits at the moment. If there are new specific units that are different to carbon credits, the ACCUs, that may affect price and there are many things in the future that may affect price 
Um, but what is certain um, on a different level is that the business sector has moved. There is a global scheme around the disclosure of financial related climate risk and how that's managed by, by companies. There's been successful litigation against superannuation companies that drive companies to actually, whether they're required to or not, purchase carbon credits and show that they are demonstrating, be able to demonstrate that they are doing things um, in relation to climate and biodiversity. So, yes, um, yes, the price will fluctuate. I think that's a given. The, the question is how much it will fluctuate by. And, and I just wanted to, to make those couple of observations. Thanks. That's great. Um, All right. I, so I'm going to jump to a question that was handed to me um, earlier, and I'm going to ask about the risk of drought. Um, it's something still very prevalent for some of us uh, in the room, and uh, it's obviously with the risk of climate change, uh, it's not going to go away any time. In fact, it's, the risk says that it's uh, more droughts and worse droughts coming our way, potentially. So um, I would like to ask Dean to begin with, um, what is the risk of drought on carbon projects and how does that get considered? Yeah, thanks. A very valid question. Um, and fire, perhaps, is the other one that can be linked but not always linked. That I'm, I'll try and touch on too, perhaps. But, um, look, there's quite a bit we could talk about on this, but the first points I would say is that it's very much got to be factored into your management of a carbon project and sort of facing reality about your current and likely circumstances because it's a 25 year um, commitment at least. So in that context, I'd remind us all that we've really got two elements to what we're talking about here. One is the, what we call the project, which is the activities, the on ground work and the carbon that's being stored in the landscape on the basis of, of, of audits and approved reports, carbon credits are issued to the project holder. So that's part one. The second part is the marketing of those and the selling and the contracting. So one of the risk strategies is to not forward contract a large portion of your ex estimated future production of carbon credits, is to manage your risk to say, I'm not prepared to forward sell more than X percent of what my project's currently forecast to produce until I see how the project's performing. There's, if the project doesn't perform as you expect and you aren't under a contract to deliver and your project delivers less carbon credits than you thought, it's disappointing clearly and can impact on your anticipated cash flow, but you're not under a contractual obligation. A project in itself doesn't lock you into producing a certain amount, but a contract to deliver under a commercial contract would. So there's normal risk management practices on that front to manage the likelihood of drought. So that, that's one, that's sort of a commercial reality uh, or a commercial strategy, I should say. The other part of the, the discussion here is around keeping on top of a project. So you're, you know, and that this is what we do and, and a good developer will, will always be doing is continually assessing through every year of the project's life, are we on track? What's happening? And we use every tool at our disposal from sophisticated remote sensing, on-ground monitoring plots uh, and conversations and eyeballs, you know, with the people that are on the ground and put the full picture together. So we're always tracking, is the project and our request for carbon offsets matching reality? And the key for a successful project is to keep those two things in alignment and not be claiming more than, in, you know, five years' time go, oops, you know, it, actually the landscape hasn't been as productive as the computer simulation model said. It's really, really important that monitoring and assessment is occurring all the way so that you're seeing any changes that are happening in as close to real time as possible. So there's, there's a monitoring and a, and a practical assessment, as well as a commercial tool for managing the risks. And just very quickly, the case of fire is an interesting one that one big advantage of the Australian scheme compared to some of the international ones is that in a sense, our scheme is insured against fire in that if carbon stocks and carbon credits have been issued 
and a fire through natural causes, not through willful lighting of a fire occurs, then it doesn't require relinquishment of the credits that have already been issued. But no further credits are earned from the burnt land until it's regenerated to what it was prior to the fire. And, and that's a really important element of the Australian carbon scheme. And, and it, it can be it's done because there is a risk of remote risk of removal buffer that's taken off all projects, you know, right from the outset. It's in a sense a, a kitty of carbon credits held uh, centrally to cover for unavoidable losses. So fire is a little little bit different than drought in that that's a single event. It can remove carbon. If it's a natural fire through natural causes and what wasn't wasn't through the actions of the project proponent, then at least you don't have to relinquish and pay back those credits. But it will will influence the cash flow from the burnt area for sure. Okay. Question time. Does anyone want to raise their hand? Yes, um, Ange. There's a <laughs> kind of blue. Yeah. Thanks. So I've got a couple of questions, and one Great. relates to the monitoring a little bit. So, who is responsible for the monitoring, and who manages that? Given these projects can be. 25 years or 100 years, you know, departments come, come and go or brokers come and go. And also, um, what obligations do the project proponents have for the eligible, eligible interest holders? What obligations do the yeah, proponents apart, have? Apart from initial consent. Uh -huh. do you want, John? Am I able to have a crack Dean? or do you want to share yeah. around? Go, Dean. Go. Um, oh, I was just thinking about the second, just quickly remind me of the first question, first part of the question. I had a... Who is responsible for monitoring oh, the project? Yes, yes. Sorry, short-term memory problem there. Um, so the project proponent ultimately is required to make sure it gets done, but in most cases, and certainly the way Select Carbon works, is through the commercial contractor service agreement with the landholder, we do that and are obliged to do it throughout the life of the project. So it's not um, government agencies that are responsible, unless they are the project holder as well. That, like Louisa was saying, maybe in your case it's different, Louisa, but normally the project developer will commit to doing all of the on-ground monitoring, the assessment, the physical measurements on ground and all the associated desktop-based remote sensing that might be partnered with that. That's certainly how we work, is that we have a commercial arrangement with the landholders, that that's our responsibility. We take responsibility for doing it and the quality of it. Uh, and it's really important that you, you have confidence in that being able to be done for the 25 years, which is the duration of most projects. Um, so that that's very important. And the eligible interest holder, there may be others who want to jump in, so I'll keep it quick. Um, ultimately, the other eligible interest holders need to provide consent, their consent for the project to proceed. What, what's required to seek their consent is there a matter for you and them to negotiate. In some cases, they might say, no problem, very happy with that. Um, a, a positive thinking foresighted bank might go, great, I can see how that builds your business. We'll sign the consent form, um, keep us informed. Others may be looking for a, a return. If we'll, we'll give consent and in return we want to know X, Y and Z. Um, in some cases it could be a share of the ACUs. In other cases it's around agreements on land access. Um, it could be anything uh, and there's no prescription around the extra requirements with obtaining that consent. It's a matter for the two parties to negotiate. But for a compliance point of view, the consent itself is all that's needed, but it's, each circumstance may require different negotiations in order to get that consent. Okay, um, Jess, I'm gonna actually, I had a, a question down here because I would um, want to know in terms of um, native title eligible interest holder consent and some of the, you know, the, the, the ways of uh, that uh, agreement and that negotiation and best practice that you're seeing and recommending. But after Jess, James from uh, Green Collar, I was wondering whether or not you would be interested in having talk about your experience, um, if that's okay. Jess. Thanks. Um, 
So I think, you know, Emily, one, one of Emily's slides, there was, um, it was native title groups were flagged as an eligible interest holder group and she also showed that map that shows where across Australia there are native title determinations. So understanding if you're interested in pursuing a project like this, understanding on whose land, if you don't already know you are, and the um, what's called a prescribed body corporate or native title rep group that represents the interest holders, native title holders for that area. South Australian Native Title Services are here, um, and, and PERSA, I'm sure, will be providing information as well um, on that. Um, what, um, what was also on Emily's slide was in those little brackets, which was start early. I think it's really important to start those conversations with native title groups early um, and really put the effort into, into having that conversation because um, what's happening in some jurisdictions in, in WA, for example, with HIR projects are being registered um, without consent. Um, and even though it's not recommended to do that, you, you know, sometimes people can get away with registering projects, but you can't actually sell um, any credits uh, through the ERF until you have that consent. Um, so you don't want to get all the way down to that point and find out that that's um, going to be a problem. Um, where we've seen it uh, work effectively is where there's a real conversation, I think as Dean said, about what does benefit sharing look like um, on, this, on this landscape, on this country, um, whether that's um, a share of the ACUs that a project generates or uh, the share of the profits is common in those kinds of agreements. Um, but what's most important is that that's what's called free, prior and informed consent. Um, and when I looked down at my notes before, I'd written that twice and I'd underlined informed twice. Um, because I think, you know, as we've heard today, this is a lot to get our heads around. Um, and, uh, and to understand and communicate um, and negotiate these takes time um, and, um, and that communication. So that informed component of informed consent is, um, is absolutely critical. I see the hand, Emily, but I might just, James, um, I understand, you, as I spoke to you earlier today and you said that you have your own project that you're doing in New South Wales, which is um, a HIR project, and, um, and you also um, rep uh, work with Green Collar, which is a carbon company. So I just uh, thought that um, if we could hear from you and your experience, in, and I'd like to know your experience of the monitoring like how, how you've managed the monitoring on your project, but also maybe how you manage the consent process um, and what you see that as, how that works. Um, thanks. thanks very much, Jen. I'll just go without the microphone. Um, yes, uh, uh, James Lego, by name. Uh, look, we've got a uh, community use regeneration project in New South Wales, in Western New South Wales. Um, our project was uh, registered in 2015.
anybody? Ah, oh, Emily, sorry. Oh, I forgot. Em, did you want to say something? Cheers, Jen. Just a, um, a very quick comment, I think, to, to pick up on a couple of points, but also to um, note the, the, carbon, the Australian Carbon Industry Code of Conduct, which sets out... I think it's in incredibly important. Get your hands on a copy if you can. Google's your friend or your search engine is your friend. If you type that in, you'll land upon it pretty quickly. Green quality, colour and select carbon are both signatories to that, which means they're, they've got requirements under it as signatories to, to follow the conduct and follow the requirements, which includes and sets out the types of information. So I think if there are people uh, in your audience today who... Um, as Jess said, there's a lot to digest. There's, you know, informed consent um, and there's a, a, an enormous amount of information out there. The Code of Conduct sets out um, sort of as a, as a minimum good practice standard what sorts of information should be shared and that's both between project developer or service provider and a landowner as well as with native title holders who have eligible interest holder consent processes to go through and I think it's a useful resource um, also emphasises and underscores the need for early engagement and actually using reasonable endeavours to try and reach agreement with native title holders before you register a project. So there's some, there's some things in there, I think, that are worth looking at. Um, and it, if you're not a signatory, um, give, a, give a plug to be one, but it's fast becoming kind of a standard for good practice. So it, it kind of, in many ways, isn't, isn't um, terribly, uh, terribly here or there, whether or not you, you are a signatory or not otherwise, other than the review and requirements to comply with if you are one, but it's, a, it's now fast becoming a standard of good practice that should be followed in any event. Okay, does anybody have a question? I can keep asking others. Um, can I get the microphone over to the far right? While it comes, I'll ask one. Um, I was wondering um, what, you know, someone was asking about, you know, the new methodology that um, for the whole rangelands, the other vegetation types that's being developed. And I know there's talk about other, you know, the work that's happening in the new soil, like improving the soil. Is there a risk if you commit to human induced regeneration method and a new one comes along that's better and allows you to accrue more credits in different types of vegetation, is there a risk that, um, that the HIR guys, people are going to miss out? Um, and I, um, I did the worst thing ever, which is my, the, I've got the political hat on, um, is asking a question I don't know the answer to, so I'm terrified what's going to come out <laughs> now that I've asked the question. But Emily, maybe if I can ask you, or Dean? Go yeah, no, no problem. Um, methods, yeah, methods are developed all the time, and there is a little bit of flexibility. It, it's largely informed by the regulations and rules and methods themselves. So, the savanna fire management is a is a good example of uh, where there's there's options to to kind of switch and upgrade, provided you you're not changing too much, and it's within the parameters of of what's what's set out in those regs. So that's that's probably a politician's answer, but. To, to be short about it, um, there's some flexibility to build on what you're doing. Um, Savannah Fire Management, for example, was what they call an avoidance project, which means it's actually limiting the emissions being emitted rather than slowing them down. And that's how they were initially um, conceived and the method dealt with that. There's now been a hybrid method developed um, and some projects are looking at whether or not they can switch across and certainly new projects um, are looking at them. So there is a degree of... There's a degree of movement, but it depends on how the methods unfold and deal with that as well. I don't know if Dean's got anything to add. Practical uh, John's also got that. something to add. So, um, uh, Dean and then John. There's, there's yeah. definitely risk. Oh, sorry. <laughs> go you, go, John. Sorry, Dean. Um, there's definitely risk, but the fundamental thing to remember here is that the method development and, the, and what the Australian government's trying to do is increase the generation of carbon credits. So when they have brought different methods in, they put mechanisms in place to transfer across. They don't want people to be disadvantaged. They actually want to increase the amount of carbon credits generated. So there's a risk, but we're talking to a group of people that are partialists in the driest state in Australia. Like, there's risk. There's this risk you know, being here. You guys <laughs> deal with it every day of the week in agriculture in a whole heap of different ways that a normal human being would never get into business about. 
And so, yes, there is risk, but there are also mechanisms in place to deal with it. Excellent. Um, hang on, Phil, and I'll just go. Hi. Yes, um, being a pastorist, we often get other pastors asking us, do you have to destock and fence that area off? Who looks after it? And everything else like that. But that's the most modern, uh, the most question asked is about destocking because we live on the Birdsville track and we don't have a lot of bushes. <laughs> All right, that is a question I've heard um, a few times myself. So, um, um, Dean, do they have to destock under the? And I and, I'm, and I'll reiterate that um, today. You know, we're really looking at the human-induced regeneration method. So, um, and there's a number of activities under that human-induced regeneration method. But Dean, is destocking one of them? So the short answer is no. They you do not need to destock. The, the methodology that you do need to show you're doing is managing the timing and extent of grazing. Destocking is the most extreme form of managing the timing and extent of grazing, and, and you're pretty much locked in if that's your method and you say we're going to do this by destocking. There's not really much to go from from there. So, I, I, you know, we don't have projects where people have to destock. Um, if someone wanted to destock for their own particular personal circumstances and they had they were legally able to do so under the conditions of their pastoral lease, then, you know, there's always horses for courses. But, um, for example, in Western Australia, and you'll have experts in the room or online for the South Australian situation, but for a pastoralist in WA to have a carbon project, they have to remain compliant with their pastoral lease obligations. There's a pastoral framework and legislation that sits behind the Land Administration Act. And one of those is to show that they're maintaining or best endeavours to maintain um, good pastoral practices and having a, a, a viable pastoral business and destocking is not a way to do that. So not only does it make it difficult to obtain legal eligible interest or in WA impossible to get el eligible interest holder consent from the WA government because you would be in breach of your pastoral obligations. But my, irrespective of that, that's very important clearly, but ir even irrespective of that, the comments that others have made too in this forum, you want your carbon project to complement and enhance your current business, not replace it. You know, I'm really very strong on, on that statement because if you replace it, you put all your eggs in a new basket and all the questions about price and certainty, you know, suddenly become everything. But if you've got a carbon project that complements and enhances your existing business, it's icing on the cake, it's an extra income stream, it's risk management. Uh, and the best way to do that is to not destock unless your particular personal circumstances, that's the option you want to or need to pursue, but is, to, is around designing management practices for the timing and extent of grazing, which still includes animals, but it's, it's in a sense modernising our system so that we're being more flexible with where animals go and for how long are they there for and what impact are they having. Mr G. Uh, this, is the, this is the question for the, the panel uh, generally. I don't know who's probably best positioned to answer it. But as I understand, the West Australian Government and the Queensland Government have a fund. Um, uh, one's 15 mil, one's 100 mil, I might be wrong on that. Um, my question is, what's this money being used for? What specifically is the money being used for? Thank you. I'm going to ask Mr Gavin to answer that. I, and I can't talk about the West Australian <laughs> Government Fund, but the Queensland Government's established a thing called the Land Restoration Fund. And the Land Restoration Fund is being used by the Queensland Government to try and drive investment in the carbon economy. They want to see more activity in carbon projects in Queensland. So that's the first, the first thing. Um, the second component of the Land Restoration Fund specifically is trying to drive additional benefit from the carbon projects. And that benefit might, benefit might be financial or it might actually be social benefit, cultural benefit or environmental benefit. So um, someone, a number of people would have already said that Carbon projects have a lot of different benefits. You know, a soil carbon project might generate a carbon credit, but
but it actually gives you soil carbon. And you'll never hear anyone say, gee, I've got too much soil carbon. You know, soil carbon is going to be great for you. There are all sorts of benefits associated with it. The Queensland government's trying to recognise a value for some of those other benefits because we've got a whole heap of areas where the economics of the carbon project alone are probably marginal. So it might be worth doing the activity because it impre increases your productivity or it increases your soil health or um, increases the, the resilience of your enterprise. But if the carbon economics are marginal, you're not going to generate carbon credits. And the Land Restoration Fund is actually trying to put a, a dollar value into those other benefits to make the project economically viable and get it over the line, generate more carbon credits. Um, and I'm going to uh, go to Bill McIntosh and then you after that. Uh, thanks, Jen. I, John touched on a point there which I think is important from a landholder's point of view. I mean, we've talked ab about risk and one of the big risks, I think, is that the world will change and our markets will change in, in pursuit of that change. Uh, we live in a world where international protocols are really influencing us more now probably than ever before. And if we, as a, as a business, you incorporate a carbon carbon project into your business, whatever it might be, your product can come out of that with an extra accreditation or tick. And you, it's an insurance against the world market saying, we actually don't want your product unless you are accounting for your carbon or in fact your carbon uh, neutral. So it's a bit of insurance and it's, in, in the meantime, you might even be able to make some money out of it as well. Yeah, so it's, a, a, you know, when we're talking co-benefits and the co-benefits that the Land and uh, Environment Restoration Fund in Queensland and the other fund in WA, they're, you know, they're wanting to, um, I guess, incentivise or, in, or add additional um, insurance into the project and, and incentivise people to take a, a, to participate. So, Emily, um, you had a comment? Yeah, just, just very quickly, um, both funds are in essence, uh, well certainly the Queensland Fund is in essence another government buyer in the market, so they are actually purchasing the, the ACCUs that we've been talking about and separately under the contracts, the, the templates and everything are online, they separately purchase uh, the delivery of identified co-benefits. Um, so that's how they're operating and, and it is all of what your other um, guests have noted I want to pick up on Bill's point, which is the direction that comes from internationally and, and point out that the UN Convention on Biodiversity has been around for as long as the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. They were sister conventions both adopted in Rio in 1992. And this year and last year prior to COVID, there's been an incredible uptick of corporates and other stakeholders now attending negotiations under the Convention on Biodiversity. That's reflected, as I mentioned, in the in the direction that's been recommended on the EPBC Act federally. And, and it's certainly, you know, South Australian government, Queensland government, WA government and other governments are identifying the, the, that confluence of co-benefits, that the blending of environment, biodiversity, cultural, social and economic. And, and, a, and therefore, I think it's a watch this space and, and very much working out ways to, to do what Queensland and others are doing in, in making that economic. Another question? Um, I can. <laughs> I've got many. Okay, I'm going to ask one. Um, I want to understand um, what about the emissions of cattle and sheep on the place? Like, how are they like a farm's emissions, its own emissions? So, you know, obviously it's sequestering carbon and, um, and being paid for that carbon in the vegetation under a human induced regeneration method. But uh, the old cow and sheep isn't uh, carbon neutral, unfortunately. So are they accounted for? Is that accounted for? Um, how does that work? Do we need to be able to calculate the two? John? You've touched on my favourite opportunity. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they're, they're um, counted in Australia's um, national count, um, but a landholder's not penalised for them. Mm -hmm. And that creates an opportunity. It means that if you can reduce the emissions from your herd, then there's actually the chance to recognise a benefit there. And there is a method, the herd improvement method for that. There's some real challenges with that method in terms of the size of the herd you need to make it worthwhile. So it, it wouldn't be applicable um, 
theoretically it would be possible, but practically it wouldn't be applicable um, in South Australia. I'm just trying to think about what land holdings have changed hands since I was last down here. But um, there's a huge opportunity around that. And, basic, and simply put, it is um, what can you do to increase the efficiency of your turn off? How can you grow the meat, the protein, quicker, more efficiently with less emissions? So that's having less, less livestock for the same amount turned off, having them on your property for less time, and that's all done through um, all the things that we like to do, you know, improve herd management, improved infrastructure, improved genetics, all the things that, um, uh, that graziers are aiming to do anyway. And so that's, that's one of those points that Dean was talking about and, and Dr. Moore raised earlier, is that thing around, you know, do the things that actually add value regardless of the carbon dollar and you'll never lose. And herd improvement's one of those things. Um, I think the report actually acknowledges that um, opportunity and that method um, just briefly, doesn't it? There's, so there's um, the report that's um, been released today does actually talk a little bit about that opportunity and that method that, that exists. So um, worth having a look at. Um, Dr. Moore? Yep. Jim? Sorry. No, I swapped between the two. The demonstration of that is groups like NFF and MLA making commitments around carbon neutrality. So MLA already has their roadmap to yep. carbon neutrality for the red meat industry. Um, there's, there's sort of three, I mean it, it's much more complex, but there's three key reasons for that. One, we can all hope is because they want to see a better climate future and that is good for landholders, that's good for pastoralists. But the other one's about market access and that's, that is real now and will continue to emerge and we've seen that in all sorts of things over time. I mean we can just look at how Australia's um, weathered the storm and pardon the pun of the mulesing debate. Um, but there's also that opportunity early on to try and uh, recognise an increased benefit at the moment. And, and you know I, I, I can be reasonably cynical, a lot of the times when you're at the front of the market you can say, yep, I've got carbon neutral beef now, I'm going to recognise a financial return, an increased return than I would have if it wasn't carbon neutral. But eventually the market's going to catch up and just expect that. And we see that with, you know, um, FSC certification for timber or dolphin friendly tuna. Remember when that was a thing? But now all tuna is dolphin friendly. People just expect it. You're not going to, you, you lose your market edge as the market matures. And so it, it will be that shift from reward to compliance. Uh, Emily. Um, only because we were talking about it earlier and it seems topical, I just want to pull the pin out and lob a carbon, carbon border tax adjustment little grenade into the room that, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of this and, you know, market or otherwise, free trade agreements and international um, arrangements are fast going to push on on the economics of Australia, and I think that's sort of inevitable, and 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 really that's why you also have industry and business moving as well, and begrudgingly or progressively, um, 
it's a direction that we can see coming and um, I just wanted to sort of make that observation. <laughs> I'd probably lean on the detonator as we all walk out the room, out of the room given I, I've also checked the clock, but I just wanted to add that in as well. That's okay. Um, James, um, I wanted to ask you, are you promoting your carbon farming uh, property project on your farm? And if you are, how are you doing it? Like, how do you tell people about... Um, it, is it part of your marketing? Is it something that you're um, putting on a website? Or, you know, if you have any of that stuff, is that...? Dean or uh, uh, Louisa, I know, uh, uh, Bianca actually. Oh, hi Bianca. Um, Dean, I'm going to ask you, are you seeing, and John, um, are you seeing anyone promoting um, their carbon farming activity as part of, like, in their marketing? I mean, you know, is there um, any of that happening yet or is it hasn't caught on quite yet? Dean? Yeah, no, there definitely are people that are doing that. So for an individual to do it, it tends to be those that are, have some kind of direct marketing or a brand from their product. So uh, it's probably a bit too much of a generalisation, but the smaller producers closer to cities um, who are, you know, go to a farmer's market, for example, they're, they're well suited um, to be talking about their environmental credentials, carbon or otherwise. For the larger producers where you're a, a part of a supply chain, then the custody of that animal changes along the path. So you need then to be partnering with others along the supply chain to be obtaining those kinds of benefits. So I think we're, that that's changing pretty rapidly too, but is a little bit further behind because of the complexities of a supply chain. Um, but we're working with people that um, are on the supply chain right through to retail. There's red meat producers in Australia that have carbon neutral product already. Um, and others that are, are aiming to move that way. Uh, and the feedback from them is that, you know, retailers are very much looking for for that. You know, at, at the moment, it's an extra. And as I guess, as John was alluding to, you know, and I know everyone in the room will feel like, you know, here we go again, agriculture, we've got an opportunity 
for obtaining extra value and then it will be a requirement to yet another requirement. But if this requirement is also building your business, I feel less fearful in that one. But the, the retail sector is feeding back to the supply chain to say, we, we're valuing this. Um, we want product on our shelves that has a verifiable tick, if you like. So yes, it's very much is happening and is happening more and more. So yes, there are definitely people doing it and that connection to your market is, is a key there and, and that's the same with all of our primary production. You know, if, if to, to generate the increased return, that connection needs to be there. Um, we're also seeing, so we're seeing people marketing their, their product and using the carbon neutrality as a benefit. We're also seeing people marketing their carbon credit and the way it's produced as being um, the additional value, and, that, and that's reasonably common, particularly in the north of the country with savannah burning projects. But I think for partialists here, I mean, that in the extensive grasslands, extensive rainlands of Australia, there's a whole heap of beef that's produced organically. Some of that is marketed. People go through the accreditation process, they see the value and they market it aggressively and, and see a benefit there. Some people are producing effectively organic beef and it's just not, they don't go through the regulatory, the, the um, accreditation process, so they don't get an increased benefit. And, it, and there's, a, there's a spectrum there. And it, this is very, very, very similar. It's up to the individual producer. Okay, um, this should come to no surprise for the people who know me, but we, I think we've gone over time um, and I've asked too many questions. Um, but so I'm going to finish off, Bianca, I'm really sorry. Um, hopefully it wasn't really important. Um, but what, I'm, what I want to do is um, ask of everyone on the panel, including, and I'm going to start with Louisa because she's been very quiet uh, there. Um, I want to um, know what do you want to see happen next in this space? And Louisa, I was wondering, um, I think it's rather timely I come to you because um, I, I wanted to note that uh, Louisa and PERSA, G Department of Environment and PERSA are working together in this space um, and we are working on an interim approval process um, uh, that acknowledges the role of the pastoral board um, in uh, approving uh, carbon farming projects on a pastoral lease and, um, and obviously the Department of Environment is responsible for the eligible interest holder consent of the state government, well not the department, the minister for environment and water is the eligible interest holder consent giver. So, um, Louisa, what would you like to see next in this space? Thanks, Jen. Um, yes, I was going to mention the fact that we are developing this um, procedure that everyone um, will be able to clearly see what the steps are to be able to achieve the minister's consent, as is an eligible interest holder. Um, but also, I just wanted to um, let people know that the state government's released a climate change action plan, and that does include a commitment to develop a carbon farming roadmap for the state. Um, and we're doing that in partnership with the Department for Primary Industries and Regions, so PERSA and other agencies. Um, and we, we do want to do a range of things, including looking at measures to stimulate the supply of carbon credits in the state, um, but we also want to understand and improve the business case for undertaking these different types of carbon projects. Um, and as was mentioned, fit for productivity, environmental and social benefits. So um, I guess watch this space with, with PERSA and in partnership with our department on what that roadmap might look like because we will be engaging with the ag industry on that. Uh, Dean and Emily, um, can you tell us, tell us uh, just quickly, um, uh, Dean first, what would you like to see happen next in this space? Especially for this audience, I would like to see us collectively enhance current methods, develop new methods that bring in greater capacity for the, the rangelands and the pastoral sector to contribute and participate in, in carbon farming opportunities. Emily? No, I'm glad that, um, I'm glad Dean mentioned that one because certainly harmonisation and active land management I think is, is a good one. But for me, um, I think what I'd like to see is, is clarification under Article 6 and, and that 
and an increase in international linking and bilaterals at the international level because that will in, in, influence the supply and demand here within Australia around delivery and pathways for selling units and, and recognition of units um, overseas here and here overseas as well. Yeah, that would be great. Bill, what would you like to see happen next in carbon farming? Uh, probably quickly two things. Yeah. Uh, firstly, a, a really good conversation in our community about the potential here. And, and secondly, probably an acceleration of uh, develop, developing some of those other layers of accounting, like, uh, you know, it's like a whole of, whole of region uh, carbon scheme or even including biodiversity credits. Yeah. That. Jess. Um, I agree with everything everyone else has said, which is great, because I can add my two things. <laughs> um, so I think I'd like to see anyone who could participate in this industry um, be able to, mm. so removal of any kind of barriers to entry, and one of those barriers is access to information, um, sort of independent information. I think one of the concerns we have is that um, a lot of the expertise is sitting with carbon project developers who can be amazing partners, um, but um, I guess our offer is to, to Indigenous um, landholders that we can provide funding as we've done in WA for groups to get the information, the kind of information that um, was in Dean's presentation about the productivity of your land and where the project area is and how much estimated carbon you can produce over 25 years and what that might be worth um, so that you are making informed decisions about what you want to do next. Um, and then the second part was that um, people are really maximising the benefits of this opportunity. So, and that's in understanding who you partner with and what they offer and what the benefits sharing looks like. So it's not just a set and forget, it's something that you're, you know, you're really engaged in, sort of really extracting all the opportunity you can from it. That's great. John. Thanks, Jen. Um, thank you, firstly, for the opportunity. Um, I think you've made two critical mistakes <gasps> this afternoon. Oh, One of them was the giving <laughs> Tim the opportunity to talk and not setting a time limit on it. Um, the second was letting me have the last say. Um, <laughs> in terms of what I would like to see, it, it really leads on from that. Um, I'd like to see landholders participating in the carbon market in an informed way. And that, to me, means no one signing a contract with someone that isn't a signatory to the CMI, the, to the code of practice, okay? So that would be my number one thing. If you're a landholder considering this and you're talking to a project developer, are you a signatory to the code of practice? Um, but then the next step from that, and anyone that's heard me talk before, I apologise. Seek independent legal advice, seek independent financial advice, I know lawyers and accountants seem like they're a rip-off. It will save you money and pain in the long term. And it's not often I say that about lawyers particularly. Um, no Sorry, offense. Anne, no offence. And, and, um, <coughs> yeah, I, right of reply. <laughs> I have been... I was one of those people saying, oh, great, Emily's talking, that's amazing. Um, but, yeah, absolutely, landholders, you need to go into this in, a, in, a, in an informed way. It's like every other really complex decision you make in agriculture. Um, and it's okay to make the decision not to participate. It's okay to make the decision to participate, but make a decision. Don't just sort of walk away today thinking, oh, it's all a bit complex, I'm just gonna let that one wash over me, because it is gonna come catch up. So just seek the information, make the decision, one way or the other. Great, and it's not really, you're not really gonna be the last one because Miss Bianca Lewis has um, been very patiently waiting with her hand up online and I feel like I should go to her because she sits behind me and uh, I'll hear about it if I don't. <laughs> Bianca. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Look, I'll, very quickly, I guess, I guess just recapping everything everyone's just said, my point was really about the barriers to access and, and our minister, unfortunately I didn't get to hear the minister this morning and I'm sure he spoke about that, some of the challenges we have with the current pastoral act 
And as we've heard from Louisa and both from Jen, obviously we're working actively through that now to set up those pathways under the current Pastoral Act. But meanwhile, concurrently alongside that, we're reviewing that and we're trying to put in place a new act which does facilitate and get around those barriers to access that we currently have for these alternative land uses. So that's really the point I wanted to make. And the question you asked the other panel members, Jen, about what questions you get most, one thing I get about the new pastoral bill that we're trying to put in place is but I can't see carbon farming mentioned in there. Can I do carbon farming? And the simple answer is yes. It is considered, you know, what we term an alternative land use. But as you probably all picked up on today, because of the rapidly moving environment, we don't intend on locking down in detail in that in that new act exactly what methods and the process around those methods because we don't want to constrain that market inadvertently. So I just want people to take away that it is something we're actively working in and there's reasons why you don't explicitly see carbon farming and how it works outlined in that new proposed piece of legislation. But rest assured that is exactly what we're working towards. Very well done. Okay, um, I am uh, going to wrap up the session and thank you for all your time and your patience. Um, I don't very get this opportunity very often um, to ask a lot of questions. Um, yeah, we're going to have lunch downstairs. Um, we can go out that front door. The door will, the door will be opened. Um, and yeah, thank you. Um, I just I just wanted to reiterate. So um, this has been recorded today. We're going to send this recording out. We're going to make the slides available. Um, on, and I will also um, go on the hunt. And uh, it's something that Louisa and I are both working on to set up a space um, where a lot more up to date and relevant climate information, uh, carbon information will be available carbon farming information specifically related to the pastoral rangelands. But what I would encourage you to do, if you haven't already picked up a cop pick up a copy of the report, there's more in boxes here if they're run out. There's fact sheets that are specific to bi pastoral business uh, case studies. And there's also a really good general one that just provides a bit of a really good general overview, but also talks about the things you need to think about when we're um, when you're considering a carbon farming project. So there is going to be a lot more happening in this space, a lot more information, a lot more talks, a lot more opportunity to chat. Um, and um, I'm always willing to have a chat. Uh, that should also come as no surprise. Um, all right, go have lunch. Enjoy, get up, walk around. Thank you. And thank you for everyone who came today. Um, John, Jess. Emily and Dean, thank you for joining us online. And Louisa, I'm sure I'll be talking to you very soon. Thanks, Ella and, and Greg as well.